Today we're going to be driving an LT1 10 speed and it's a little chilly out and no we are not in Utah we are in Las Vegas and it snowed up in Summerlin. So let's do a cold start on this LT10 speed. Here we are sitting in the LT10 speed early JK. You can see we're going to be warming the batteries up on our drone because batteries don't like to be run that cold. So let's put the key in and listen to how long this cranks before it starts. Now you notice that the one touch start took over. I just hit the key and then it cranked until it started. One of the reasons it cranked longer than normal is because the LT is direct injected. So it has multiple fuel pumps. It has a low pressure pump that feeds the high pressure pump. So essentially the low pressure pump turns on feeds the high pressure pump. When the computer sees that the low pressure pump has supplied sufficient pressure to the rail, then the high pressure pump takes over, builds up hundreds if not thousands of PSI pressure, and then the injectors go off which cause the engine to start. So that process takes a little bit longer than a standard gas engine. But the advantage is you're running direct injection, so you're putting that fuel directly into the combustion chamber. You're not like a carburetor going through an intake manifold or a throttle body having to go through the intake manifold where the walls get wet, you lose some fuel, it's just not as efficient. Port injection, of course, is much better. Port fuel injection was the standard for a lot of years prior to onboard diagnostics too. When OBD2 came out, we went to sequential fuel injection, and really the difference is the control of the injectors. With sequential injectors, we can control each individual cylinder. So if we were to find that one cylinder was misfiring, we could turn off that injector so we weren't polluting. Direct injection is the culmination of all those technologies and obviously the most efficient. However, like everything else, direct injection doesn't come with its downsides. Direct injection has actually been around for a long, long time. I know Ford experimented with it back in the 1970s. They just didn't have the technology of the nozzles that wouldn't wear out, some of the other metallurgy that was required. And of course, you've got a pump, a mechanically driven pump that's putting out thousands of PSI. It just wasn't ready for production. But today, obviously, it is. And the manufacturers have decided that the advantages outweigh the negatives. Some of the negatives would be obviously the cost, but when you're in a mass produced engine like this, the cost comes way down and that's evidenced by, let me get the heater on here. We're gonna see if this uh, snow will come off easily on the windshield. So the mass production really brings the cost down and right now a direct injected LT1 is about the same price as a LS3 and that tells you a lot because the LS3 is a very primitive motor compared to the LT1. It's not a bad engine, it's just more simple. It has no active fuel management, no direct injection, just none of the technology that the, that the new uh, LTs have. The new LTs also have continuous variable valve timing. So the supply and demand of these engines has caused the price to cross over where the LT1 and the LS3 now are similar in price in the retail market. Another disadvantage might be carbon behind the intake valve, although I do think GM has got that handled. I know a lot of guys complain about it, especially in the old days with the European direct injection setups, and they had processes where they would clean the back sides of the valve. But GM used some patented technology with variable valve timing, continuous variable valve timing, to keep the valves clean. And I can say that the LTs that we've torn down, replaced intakes and stuff, we've ha found very little evidence of carbon building up in the back side of the valve. Some guys also complain about blow-by in the oil and run a catch can. Now GM does run a catch can in some of their engines, especially the high-performance engines, but others they don't. I've had customers drive tens of thousands of miles with LTs and report back with catch cans. And in general, they might capture an ounce, two ounces, three ounces maybe at the most over a long period of time. And that's really not too much to worry about, I don't think. I think GM did their diligence in this motor, and I think the technology is definitely rationalized. They're now focusing on other technologies like dynamic fuel management, stop-start. All right, let's see if this windshield's gonna clear. Yeah, no problem. One of the advantages I found with the LT, which is somewhat consequential to the high compression, the engine we're in right now has 11 and a half to one compression, is that the heater warms up faster. We're building up heat faster than if we had a lower compression engine. 
At the same time, and I still don't have an explanation for this, the LTs do seem to cool better. Same size radiator, same displacement engine, same circumstances, we find that the LTs tend to run cooler than the LSs. So GM has put a lot of effort into the LT series of engines. The research and development really shows, and it's not just in the LT engine, but it's also in the transmission. If we look at the new 8 and 10 speeds, and these engines really are market leading in my opinion. And if you look at some of the new technology that's coming out, uh, I haven't really looked at that new Cadillac, but I've heard it's pretty awesome, the new Escalade. Um, and most of us aren't going to buy a hundred and something thousand dollar SUV, but that blazed the technology for the rest of us. So some of the developments may not interest you, like a lot of guys don't like stop start, and I'm probably one of them. I come from an era when an engine stalls, especially at a light, you think something is wrong, even though something isn't. It does put a higher burden on the charging system, batteries, starters, all that. They do beef up the engine bearings to handle more start cycles. Some situations, and I do have stop start in some of my vehicles, I think stop start can save you some fuel. Maybe a couple of miles to the gallon, especially if you're in a lot of stop and go traffic where you're sitting at one spot for a long period of time. But obviously if you're on the highway, you get on the highway, you drive a thousand miles and you get off, it's not really gonna save you anything. I have noticed with our stop start Pacifica, that we have to replace the batteries virtually every year and we're using good quality batteries because my wife drives in the city a lot and the system is constantly under stress so rather than take a chance I'm preemptive and I just replace the battery batteries because they do run a secondary battery just like the JL and the JT I replace them every year so let's talk about this a minute because we had this same concern with the LS's and that is guys mix and match they buy a 2007 6L80 and then a 2012 6 liter or 6.2 whatever and they put them together and then it didn't work right they didn't know why well that's why we always say try to get the engine and transmission from the same year vehicles GM's pretty consistent about making those work but in 2007 and 8 things were very different between 2009 and 2009 was very different to 2010 so while in some cases you can fudge it and make a 2009 transmission work with a 2010 engine or vice versa sometimes a 2008 with a 2009 it just never was right they just never worked a hundred percent sometimes we would update the engine like let's say you had a 2008 l92 you could update the engine the injectors and the oil pressure sensor and run run it with a late model transmission like a 2010 and up but the point is the lt went through the same growth so 2017-18 really worked good. 2014 to 2016, especially with the six-speed, work well. Now we have a lot of 2014 to 2016s with eight speeds that work great. Sometimes they take a little bit more tuning, a little bit more learning, or the adaptives take longer to set, but we can get those to run pretty good. But if you got a choice, the 17 and up, I think, are kind of like the LS's 2010 and up. You're just gonna have less effort into it to get the result you want. In 2017, GM introduced the T87A transmission controller. Now, we all know that the LTs use the E92 engine controller, and GM Performance uses that controller for their over-the-counter LT1 performance engines and the other LTs that GM Performance sells. The T87 was a great engine controller. It was the early TCM. You can only use it with the earlier transmissions. So 14, 15, 16, and there's different service numbers, so make sure you get the right one. 2017, when the T87A came out, it was definitely a big improvement, but at the same time, GM locked down the bootloader. So it became much more difficult to tune. You have to send the module out to HP tuners, have it unlocked, then you can tune it. And you can't read it, you can only tune it. So that means, get the tune, modify it, put it in the vehicle. You don't know what's in the vehicle because you can't pull it out. So you gotta be careful about that. In 2019, with the L86, L83, etc., GM went to a new T87A, and it works pretty much like the 17 and 18. The main difference we find is the Prindle control, or the internal mode switch, the IMS. It seems to be set up differently than the earlier T87A, so they're not interchangeable. I'm not really sure why they did that, but a clue might be when they went to the L84 and the L87, they went to a new T93 controller. And the T93 controller, of course, is a completely different module, connector, wiring than the T87A. So it does appear that the 19 T87A might be a go-between between the T93 vehicles and the earlier 
T87A vehicles. And I know that's starting to get pretty complex, but this is the stuff we have to figure out. And dealers don't even know this stuff. Dealers basically go off the VIN number and it tells them what component to use. We have to figure out what is compatible with what. And that's what we did with the LS as many years ago. We have that down pat and it's what we have to figure out with the LT engine. So what I'm driving right now is a 2020 transmission with a 2019 T87A controller. And while you're not in the vehicle, I can tell you that it shifts wonderful. A lot of traffic out here in Red Rock. Yes, this is Red Rock. You really can't see it. I've seen it under snow many a times. I think this time probably a little more than the others. So let's talk about what's going on with the LT right now and the evolution. GM is really starting to refine the engine. When the direct injected LT took over from the LS, I think there were some rough edges. And year after year, we're seeing GM refine, improve. Here's really what's important. We're not losing anything. We have better emissions. We have better power than we ever had before in the previous generation of engines. We have better economy. Everything has improved. You look at some of the engines like the LT4, LT5, and even the LT1, they're tremendously powerful. This Jeep I'm driving right now, I don't know what's going on with it, but I think it's got 538s, and as heavy as it is, this thing feels like a slot car. What you also have to consider about the LT1 and the other LTs in general is just how docile they are. These engines are perfectly smooth. There are no vibrations, there are no resonances, there is no rumpity rump. In fact, most of these engines can idle between four and 500 RPM and still outperform the competition. Yes, you can get an LS3 or a Hemi 6.4 with a cam and get 500 horsepower, but this engine will do it and grandma will drive it to the store in complete comfort. And that's saying a lot because if you look at the last generation of engines like an LS, you take a L99, L94, L9H, whatever, you put a cam in it, you get 500 horsepower, you get a little bit of that rump, rump, rump at idle. Bottom end's a little bit soft because the cam you know, you don't have as much compression. You're pushing about 10 to 1 compression in those engines. And then, of course, when you get it into the higher revs, it pulls hard. This engine's not like that. This engine is powerful right off the line, right off idle, right up through the red line, and everywhere in between. And then when you do come to a stop or you're wheeling off-road, you're taking over at 500, 600 RPM. In fact, in some operating systems, I actually raise the idle because I think they're too low for what we do. When you're doing some really serious rock crawling, I like to have the idle up just a little bit because especially if you have hydraulics, you're cranking on the steering wheel, maybe your air conditioning's on, you get a lot of load on the engine and if you're just ticking over at four or 500 RPM, that can stall the engine. And speaking of low RPM, a lot of the LTs have vacuum pumps for the brakes and a vacuum pump that's driven off of the crankshaft basically means as long as that crankshaft is turning, you got engine brakes. Most of you know that the V6 Penstar JKs had a vacuum booster pump so that when you rev the motor up or the vacuum fell off, it would turn an electric motor on and create additional vacuum for the, for the brake booster so that you would maintain your vacuum. Well, you don't really have that problem with the V8. You have more cubic inches, so even if you did use intake manifold vacuum like we do on the LT1s, it's not a problem. And then on the truck engines, if you use the vacuum pump, that's even one step better in my opinion. Now, regarding the new L84, L87, they don't have power steering pumps, just like all the LTs, but everything is going to electric, brakes, steering, you name it. So a lot of these accessories are just dropping off the engines and it's more efficient to go the other route. A lot of us didn't trust fly-by-wire, brake-by-wire, drive-by-wire for the longest time, but as technology advances, it's getting more and more reliable and there's no doubt that it's more efficient. If you take drive-by-wire, for example, where the engine control module controls the throttle body and there's a separate module called the TAC module or the throttle actuator control module, you have a throttle body, a ECM with the TAC module in it, and the TAC module is actually a separate module inside of the ECM. In the early days, the Gen 3s had it on the firewall. It was external to the ECM, but it was subject to dirt and debris and water, and you could go and reduce power easily, so they put it inside of the ECM. Then, of course, you have your APP, or Accelerator Pedal Position Sensor, which is your gas pedal. And by making that electronic, you can actually make the engine more efficient. And you ask how? Well, if you take an old carburetor and you just floored it, like I remember the old DZ302 engines in the Camaros, and the same thing with the Boss engines in the Fords and the 340s and the Chryslers. If you have a smaller displacement engine, you just floor it, you're going to drop vacuum off in the intake in excess of what is efficient. So the engine would bog. You had to literally let your foot out of the throttle to get it to pull again. Well, with an electronic throttle body, it knows exactly how much to open that, that throttle body 
to give you maximum power and efficiency. So even if you just floor it, it's going to control that throttle body to get you maximum performance and economy based on the circumstances. And then on the flip side, you can also control the throttle body for things like traction control and torque management. And that's how some of these guys can go out in their exotics and be heroes instead of zeros on the track because they literally just go out and floor it. And being able to manipulate the throttle and the brakes and everything else, that car will go around the track without a lot of driver skill. So I'm still an old-fashioned guy. I, I prefer not to have stop-start the least amount of evasive electronics as possible. Now, that may not be true for Grandma because Grandma is driving her Cadillac in a, in a snowstorm and the more electronic aids she has, probably the better. There's Red Rock in the snow. I think if you go back and you look at some videos in the past, you'll see Red Rock in the snow. And speaking of the past videos, if you go back to, I think it was around mid-2016, when we first started doing our LT swaps, and this is where I'll probably end this video because I don't want it to drag on too long and we got a lot of new builds coming up. You'll notice that when I first got into the LT, uh, the first one was a six speed and then we did some eight speeds. I was kind of on the fence. Is it worth going to the LT? Does GM have it figured out? And I was ambiguous in my decision. I said, we're gonna see. And back then I think that was true. I think that transition from the LS to the LT wasn't bumpy at all. I mean, it was actually pretty seamless. However, there was some learning to be done just like there was with the LS. But now fast forward almost four years and I can unequivocally say there's nothing else out there like these LTs. And GM has continued to pump technology into these. The new 10-speed transmissions, the new operating systems and modules are making these more and more efficient. So I think we finally come full circle. 2016, we did our first LT swaps and we were learning a lot as was GM and that's important to know if GM has a problem with their powertrains we're going to have the same problem because we mimic exactly what GM does we're using their harnesses and modules and operating systems and calibrations and that's just how it is so as GM improved their powertrains we improved along with them you got to remember I grew up in the 1970s when 9 to 13 miles to the gallon was considered normal and we were pushing 150 to 250 horsepower. Now, yeah, the muscle car era of the late 60s and early 70s, these engines were 350, 400 horsepower. I've got LS6s, I've got Hemi 426s, I've got all sorts of muscle cars, but I can tell you that out of the box, one of these LTs, especially the LT1, will outrun most of those muscle cars. And if you look at the chassis, those cars didn't have very good suspension, they didn't have good brakes, they didn't have good tires. My LS6 Chevelle, it's a 1970, while well, rated at 450 horsepower, with the stock tires, you couldn't run 13 in the quarter because it would just smoke the tires. I remember losing traction in the, in the third, fourth shift. So you put slicks on them and you beef up the chassis and all that, you can get better times. Point being that with these modern powertrains, you're putting out similar, if not more horsepower, with much more docile behavior. You can idle this LT1 all day long. You didn't want to idle that LS6 all day long. The hydrocarbons coming out of that thing would make your eyes water. So we've come a long, long way with these gas engines. And I think there's a reason that the gas engine has ruled for the last 100 years over the other sources like diesel and electric. And that is because manufacturers have strived to continually improve the efficiency and economy of these. And we're living in the golden age right now, guys. I really think that, especially myself, seeing what I've seen over the last 30, 40 years, um, this is the golden age. We've got vehicles that can outperform anything in the past while getting better economy and lower emissions. So take advantage of it when you can.